this great question. Hey Claire, my name is Omar from Leeds and where am I taking you back to today? The Showtime series The Tudors with Jonathan Rhys Myers, so the reign of Henry VIII. Question one. In season one, there is a homosexual relationship between Sir William Compton and the composer Thomas Tallis. Is there any evidence to suggest that this relationship actually happened? And in season two, there is a relationship between Max Meaton and George Berlin, which would be really ironic considering how it all panned out. Is there any evidence to suggest that that actually happened? Loving the videos, Claire. Keep up the good work and wishing you all the best of uh, health and happiness. Take care. Bye -bye. So that was Omar's great uh, question or questions regarding the alleged relationships between Sir William Compton a member of King Henry VIII's Privy Chamber, and musician and composer Thomas Tallis, and then George Boleyn, Lord Rochford, and court musician Mark Smeaton. In the Tudors series, Henry VIII's good friend William Compton pursues a homosexual relationship with Thomas Tallis, but is this based on fact or is it just a fictional storyline? Well, both men existed, Compton was close to the king from early in his reign, attending a joust with the king in January 1510, in disguise, the king in disguise too, and causing panic when one of the two disguised men was injured. And a man who knew that the king was there cried out, God save the king. The king was forced to reveal his identity to settle people's fears. Compton was described as being so seriously injured that it was thought that he might die. But he recovered and served the king as his groom of the stool until Cardinal Wolsey's Eltham ordinances, his purge of younger men in the king's privy chamber, forced his resignation in 1526. He managed to stay close to the king though, but sadly two years later, in June 1528, he died during an epidemic of sweating sickness. At the time of his death, Compton was married with a six-year-old son, Peter. He'd married Werberga, daughter of Sir John Brereton and widow of Sir Francis Cheney, in 1512. He appears to have been unfaithful to her with Lady Anne Hastings, sister of the Duke of Buckingham. But is there any hint at all of Compton being involved with Thomas Tallis? Well, no, not at all. Tallis didn't even come anywhere near the royal court until 1543, when he joined the choir of the Chapel Royal, and that was 15 years after Compton's death. The two men are unlikely to have crossed paths in the 1510s and 1520s, as nothing is known of Tallis until the early 1530s, when he was working as an organist at Dover's Benedictine Priory. Also in the Tudors series, Thomas Tallis is depicted as bisexual and he has relationships with twins Joan and Jane, another fictional device. He did marry a woman named Joan, widow of fellow gentleman of the Chapel Royal Thomas Berry, but not until Queen Mary I's reign. Neither Tallis or Compton are linked romantically or sexually with any men. But what about George Boleyn, brother of Queen Anne Boleyn and court musician Mark Smeaton, who was executed with George on the 17th of May 1536 after both men had been found guilty of having sexual relationships with Anne Boleyn and plotting with her to kill the king? Is there anything to suggest that they were involved sexually? Well, historian Retha Warnick would argue yes. The evidence that she uses to back up the claim is the fact that George gave or loaned a book to Mark Smeaton, a work that was a satire on marriage. The satire was a translation by Jean Lefebvre of Mathieu of Boulogne's 13th century satirical poem, The Lamentations of Matthiolus. The poem is an attack on women written by a man betrayed by one. 
In the poem, Matthieu likens women to basilisks, and he refers to a chimera with horns and a tail, and the mother of all calamities, and writes of how all evil and all madness stem from her. It definitely belonged to George because it bears the inscription, this book is mine, George Boleyn, 1526. And it certainly was in Smeaton's possession at some point, because it also bears the inscription, à moi, Monsieur Marc S. However, it's a leap to suggest that this means the two men were involved sexually, because there is another inscription in the manuscript, the signature of Thomas Wyatt the Elder, another courtier and a man who, like George, was a poet. What Warnick does not mention is that this poem was widely circulated among scholars in Europe and that, as pointed out by Floyd Gray in Gender, Rhetoric and Print Culture in French Renaissance Writing, it quickly became one of the most seminal examples of medieval anti-feminist and anti-matrimonial discourse. It has been suggested that Chaucer knew of this poem and drew on it heavily for The Wife of Bath's prologue, and that Christine de Pizan was inspired into refuting it in her Cité de Dame. It was probably something that was being discussed by George Wyatt Smeaton and other members of the Berlin Circle, and it is not evidence of a love affair between George and Mark Smeaton. So, no evidence for the two men being involved. And there's actually no evidence that George was gay either. The evidence that Retha Warnick puts forward for the idea that George was gay is as follows. One, words in a poem called Metrical Visions by George Cavendish, who'd been the gentleman usher to Cardinal Wolsey. Two, George's execution speech. Three, George and Jane's childless marriage. I'll handle those in order. In Metrical Visions, George Cavendish writes his verses as if they're spoken by that person. On the scaffold, he has George talking of his living bestial and his unlawful lechery, which Warnick believes points to George being gay. However, Cavendish also uses these very same words in regards to Thomas Culpepper, Catherine Howard's sweetheart, who warns his fellow courtiers of their bestiality. And when Cavendish is writing about King Henry VIII, he writes of the king's unlawful lechery. So we can't use those words to prove George was gay unless we go on to say the same of Culpepper and the king. Then there's George's execution speech. In it, he says, And I beseech you all, in his holy name, to pray unto God for me, for I have deserved to die if I had twenty or a thousand lives, yea, even to die with more shame and dishonour than hath ever been heard of before. For I am a wretched sinner who is grievously and often time offended. Nay, in truth, I know not of any more perverse sinner than I have been up until now. Nevertheless, I mean not openly now to relate what my many sins have been, since it were no pleasure for you to hear them, nor yet me to rehearse, for God knoweth them all. As I've mentioned in previous talks, even if an execution victim was innocent of the crimes they were charged with, they felt that they were deserving of death due to original sin and that any sin they'd committed had led them to this point. Execution speeches are very similar because people wanted to make a good death and to make things right with their creator. If you read the rest of George's speech, you'll see that he was using it as a final opportunity to preach of his reformed faith, to evangelise to the crowd. He wanted them to use him as an example of what sin could lead to. He saw himself as a wretched sinner deserving of death. But it is a leap again to use his words as a confession of homosexuality. Then there's his marriage to Jane Boleyn. Well, we don't know much about their marriage, only that by his death they'd been married about 11 years and they didn't have any children. 
Jane wasn't exactly an important person, though. She's not a person who'd been mentioned in ambassadors' dispatches or court records, so she may well have suffered miscarriages or stillbirths, or the couple may not have been able to conceive. We just don't know. It wouldn't have been reported. The absence of living children does not mean that George was gay or that the marriage was unhappy. Oh, and there's no evidence for the idea that Jane hated George or that she was jealous and tried to bring the Boleyn siblings down. She's not named as giving evidence against them or being a witness. And she sent George a message of comfort when he was in the tower, for which he sent her thanks. So, while these illicit love affairs, which is how they would have been seen at the time, make good TV, there is no evidence that Compton and Tallis and George and Mark Smeaton had sexual relationships or that they were gay or bisexual. Thank you, Omar, for the great question. I'm going to give you links in the description to more videos on George and Jane and also some articles too. You can subscribe to this channel by clicking round about there. You can hit the bell to be notified as videos go live and you can give me a like and leave me a comment. I think my calmness and my patience with Madge uh, going past the camera at times deserves a like. Well, perhaps Madge deserves a like. Take care. Bye-bye.